Hello and welcome to Taylor Talks Comics. I'm Taylor. I've got a great book to show off for you today. It's another artist edition. This one is Spider-Man, the Todd McFarlane collection. This book is massive. It's beautiful. A must-have for any Todd McFarlane fan. Stay tuned and be sure to watch the video all the way through. And we're back. So we're going to show off the Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man Artist Edition. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you watched my previous video on the David Mazzucchelli Batman Year One Artist Edition, then you'll know that the trim size for this is very similar. But I do want to show off in case you haven't watched that video, which please go watch that video and give this video a thumbs up if you haven't already. Uh, but I just want to show off the trim size of this because this is a bigger one. Here's the uh, Dave Cockrum's X-Men Artist Edition. There is no standard size for the, the Artist Edition format um, because what they do is that they print these the size of the original art. So Todd McFarlane was drawing some of these pages on art pages that were on pages that were this this big, and Dave Cockrum was drawing his pages this big. So they're it's as if you have the original art in hand. They wrote, they wanted to make it true to size. So this is, if there was a standard size, you typically find Artist Editions to be more of the size of Dave Cockrum's, especially later volumes. I was actually kind of surprised Todd McFarlane drew on such big paper. I didn't realize he did that. Because after a certain point in the 60s or 70s, artists primarily in the big two, Marvel DC started drawing on 11 by 17 paper, which is what you get with this format. Um, some would opt for bigger paper, which Todd McFarlane obviously did. And so did... David Mazzucchelli. Um, but to show off other books to compare, the trim size, let me get a uh, omnibus edition. The first uh, omnibus edition I pulled off the shelf was Fantastic Four by Hickman. But you can see, based on the trim size here, much, much bigger and taller than it's almost it's not quite, but it feels like it's almost twice the size and height of an omnibus. <clears throat> and then let's spin this around. So this is beautifully designed. Um, I do want to point out, you can see the, the corner here is a little dinged up. Don't expect that for OPB. Um, OrganicPriceBooks.com, they only ship things with love and care. Um, this is a review copy. So I'm assuming they had a damaged copy at the warehouse that they sent to me to do a review of. So I'm not, I mean, this was sent to me for a review copy. I'm not upset or anything and nor should I be, but I just want to point that out in case you see that on video. I don't want you to expect organic price books to send your copies of that because these are all sent in protective boxes and everything. So you'll, they'll be good to go. They ship everything with love and care. And if you uh, have any issues receiving a book that's damaged or whatnot, they have great customer service as well. So no frets there. You can see this book does come with like a glossy finish on the on the venom aspect to it, um, but it does maintain the the characteristics of the uh, original art. You can see like the strokes of the marker in there and the pin marks and the blue line method that he used on the spider in there. But we'll get more. This image is on the inside of the book too, so we'll dive more into that when we open the book. Um, here's the spine. Really cool image of Spidey upside down on the top of it. Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man, Artist Edition, Marvel, IDW. And on the back of the book, you get a really cool image of Spider-Man next to some gargoyles. Toddy Max, the Todd Father's signature there. Open this baby up. And we get an image of the Spider-Man Hulk crossover by Todd McFarlane. The... Uh, this image right here alone, and then some of the images we'll see in here, makes me wish we had a Todd McFarlane Hulk artist edition. Uh, if you're not familiar with Todd McFarlane's career, he cut his teeth at Marvel, really. The, the, the run that helped build his name up was his Hulk run that he did with Peter David. And then after that, he did Spider-Man, which then sent him in a trajectory, making him the most famous modern comic book name we have, I don't know, but this is a blown up image. So on these end papers here, which I'll flip over to the back here, 
they always do a great job of this and I love this because they blow up a panel or an image even bigger than the original size. So it's like the biggest you'll ever see Todd McFarlane's artwork probably look and it looks brilliant. You can see the blue line method he uses, which if you're not familiar, um, some artists will do their pencils with blue line because that doesn't reproduce when you then scan it in for the uh, final copy. So all these blue lines will go away. They won't be, re they won't, they won't be red when they scan it in and copy it. The only thing that will be left will be the ink lines. So that's, uh, you can see that he used the blue line method on this. And most of this, actually, this book, but. Oh, I skipped a page. Here's the opening title page. Cool image of Spidey there. Another cool image of Spidey with some birds flying over him. Here's the uh, credits you get here. Scott Beer is the director of special projects for IDW, but he's also the editor of this project. And he's the creator of the artist edition format and the editor of all of them for IDW. But now he has now <clears throat> left IDW and he's started his own company called Act 4, where he'll be doing artist editions as well as some special collections of comics, which is exciting. But I just want to point that out. Proofreader, Scott Tipton, and then Randall Dock was the designer of this book. All the special thanks here. I recognize some of those names. Holy crap. These are typically people that um, scanned in artwork for Scott to use for these collections. Like usually the owners of the original art. And here is all of the book, all the art that you'll see in this book. And I want to point out that this does not collect entire stories and subsequent runs. Like there's no like complete issues in here. It's all just a collection of random pages from these issues that Tom McFarlane worked on. This was, this used to be called an artifact edition when they would do this. There used to be a distinction at IDW. The artifact edition was like the collection of random pieces of art. The artist edition was when it collected a complete story. For whatever reason, they, they ended that designation and just across the line called them all artist editions. I'm not sure why. It was kind of nice to have that distinction, especially me as a consumer that really likes to read these stories in the artist, artist edition format. Um, now it's kind of hard to, you know, you can find out which ones collect complete stories and it's not that hard, honestly, but a little bit easier to uh, decipher, but I digress. A um, couple of things I want to point out in this credits though. Uh, letters by Rick Parker. Rick Parker is an incredible letterer. Um, he also had a great run on, on Beavis and Butthead, which I love for Marvel. Those comics are so underrated. If you ever find a ish back issue of Beavis and Butthead from Marvel of the 90s, Rick Parker did all the cartooning for him. Highly recommend him. Even if you're not a Beavis and Butthead fan. Uh, if you're just a fan of like fun, funny comics. So, but his lettering in Todd McFarlane's run really made it a complete package. So I just want to point that out. Scripts by David Michelini. Um, on all of these, except until you get to the uh, adjective of Spider-Man, which we'll talk about. All the art by Todd McFarlane, unless otherwise noted. So that means um, pencils and eeks. So you'll see on some of these pages, the first issue we have here is Spider-Man 299. The inks were by Bob McCloud. And then you don't see any... And then Tom McFarlane starts inking himself. Inks by Joe Rubinstein, Rubinstein on 304. And then he inks himself. Inks himself. And then we get to Tom McFarlane's adjective with Spider-Man. So if you're not familiar with the lineage as well, Tom McFarlane uh, started on... I don't, I don't think it was 299. He started earlier than that. But he started on the David Michelini run of Amazing Spider-Man all the way through, I think to 328, might have been his last issue. But then he got his own ongoing Spider-Man. So the first ever adjectives of Spider-Man. We've had Web of Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man, and Marvel Team-Up were previous Spider-Man runs. We never had an adjectiveless one, which just means it was just, the title was just Spider-Man. No spectacular adjective or amazing adjective or whatever. Um, so he started that run all on his own. He did all the writing and inking, and at one point did uh, coloring on one of these issues, but we won't see that in this book. Um, and then uh, Rick Parker stayed on for lettering. A great opening spread. One, I mean, here's a great example of what made Todd McFarlane special for Spider-Man. We had, like Michael Golden, I guess is credited for um, creating the webbing like this, the, they call it spaghetti web or webbing or whatever you want to call it where the webbing, webbing is like all, you know, strewn and kind of, uh, what do you call that? Fraying, like a rope. I guess Michael Golden kind of 
started that, but Mike uh, McFarlane maybe popularized it. But he also always drew Spider-Man in his very dynamic poses, uh, which was always really exciting. <clears throat> Here's the introduction. Tom McFarlane's Spider-Man Artist Edition is part of an ongoing series, one dedicated to showcasing extraordinary artists in a format as special as their work deserves. All right, so right away, I want to point out that you can see some of these pages don't fill up the whole page. So why would they make the book so big? Because he didn't write, he didn't draw on, all the pages he drew on were not fully this trim size. Um, this was more in line with, with what I showed with the uh, Dave Cockrum X-Men one, were these smaller pages. Now, I love that they collect, they collected this early issue um, of 299 that has the Bob McCloud inks, because you can really see and compare what made it special from when Tom McFarlane was doing his own pencils, or I mean his own inks, um, and when he wasn't doing his own inks. So this is Tom McFarlane when he's not doing his own inks. Um, very much more subdued and more of that, kind of that Neil Adams house style that lots of artists worked in. Um, here's the uh, first appearance or image of Venom in that panel. Great arresting image there. And then this is the first one where he does his own inks, this, this page, or this, this, this literally this page, I guess, but this issue. Uh, and the lettering by Rick Parker, again. The title lettering right here adds a characteristic to it, but also the credit lettering right here. Really, Rick Parker's lettering for, it's almost like he saw, because um, that's not what his typical lettering looks like. He was, he was a letterer that was able to work based on who his artists were and that kind of thing. So he saw what Todd McFarlane was doing with his art, where he's going for more of this horror vibe for Spider-Man, which I really loved, which then bled into what you see with Spawn. And Rick Parker was able to match that to make the issues special and make them a complete package. So I just want to point out that Rick Parker's lettering in this is amazing. Not only is lettering like the typical word balloons and captions and all that jazz, but like the title lettering and the credit lettering and sound effects and things. Here's a really cool panel because you can see the collage here. Um, image of Todd McFarlane would put behind Spidey here. And this is issue number 300, which is like a really famous issue um, of Amazing Spider-Man. There's Eddie Brock. Then here's Eddie Brock as a priest, which is an arresting image as my voice cracked there. Arresting image of Eddie Brock with some, I don't know, almost like some Dave Cronenberg body horror imagery there. Here's a uh, Todd McFarlane drawing the Fantastic Four, um, Four Freedoms Plaza, but also drawing the Thing, which is my favorite Marvel character. So that's always fun. You can see too. So, so the Artist Edition, one of the great things about it is all the charm and stuff of these original art pages. You can see all the notations that he would draw up here, the book number, the issue number, the month page, and then maybe a little notes right here. It says Web of Spider-Man number thirty-nine, which I think is telling the. Uh, editor which one to um, point out here for the caption when Marvel would always do those asterisks thing where they lead to something else but you can also see some of the characteristics in the artwork like over here this is like whited out so Todd might have drawn this head, guy's head a little bit differently and then wanted to redo it up here it looks like a word balloon or thought balloon was up here and they whited that out you can almost read what it said but they they just edited that part out for whatever reason, they, they didn't want you to know uh, Mary Jane's thoughts in that panel. And Tom McFarlane would sign all, all these pages too so you get his signature. But that's like the uh, the charm of these, is, is seeing like the whiteout and the characteristics of seeing like what the artist would be thinking and the process of making these um, pages. And when there's no color on it, you can kind of see their technique and things, uh, which if you're an artist in your own right, you can... Uh, take something from those. Shout out to David Letterman, fellow Hoosier. And then you'll notice this too. So some of these pages, like this one is more yellowed than this one. And like I said, Scott Doon Beer, I always kind of joke that he's like the Indiana Jones of original comic book art. He's always going across the world trying to find these original pages because what happens is these artists, especially early in their career, would uh, have these original art pages and then it would become like a secondary income for them to sell these original art pages at conventions and whatnot. So they would take a stack of these at a convention, sell them off, and you, you imagine like, you know, 30 different people buy one page, the original art's dispersed everywhere. 
um, which is why you don't get complete issues in these two. I assume that Scott and Beer, if he had his say in things, would probably collect complete issues, uh, but they're just not possible to find. So anyways, what I was getting to is that whoever bought this page probably didn't store it in a great way or maybe had it in a frame with sun shining on it or something. And that's why it's yellowed more than like this page is more white. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that these were owned by different people. And you can see it, it also is interesting. So this page is completely yellowed, but the whiteout has stayed. So that some, you, you could find out which medium media is uh, when you're drawing with and the artwork is more archival or holds up more than others. So it's interesting that that didn't yellow, but the rest of the page did. One thing in this run too, anytime you see someone with a cape, so here's the prowler, like this, this is like a proto, early prototype of spawn. So like, and that was like the big revelation I had the most recent time I read this. Cause I've read this run of Amazing Spider-Man and the subsequent Adjective of Spider-Man so many times. Um, I talked about this on my channel. It was probably the run of comics that got me hooked on comics for the for the long term. I grew up reading comics all the time. My brother's back issues or G.I. Joe issues, Transformers or whatever. But it's when my older brother bought me a trade paperback of the Evan Farland run that I started, that I got hooked instantly. And then I've been reading comics ever since. But in this most recent read through I had of this, when I had the omnibuses, um, that was like the revelation I had. It was like the Prowler, and I think the Shriek was the other character. They have capes. You can see Todd McFarlane working out those, those kinks of what we would see in his uh, spawn run later. Here's a great panel layout with all this great webbing on here. Todd McFarlane really working out his ideas and becoming his own. Like we're, This is the run where you see Todd McFarlane become the Todd McFarlane we all know and love. Here's that uh, end paper. Was that the end papers? No, that was just an, a blown up image we saw. Yeah, but that's the Spider-Man with the gargoyles. Oh, there's a the Shriek character. So not quite the Spawn cape, but you can see him working it out with all the hair and stuff. Like this is like early prototypes for what we'd see in Spawn. And I, I did, I was always a big fan of the, uh, just the, the mundane melodrama that Todd McFarlane would draw for Mary Jane and Peter, who have quite the uh, roller coaster of a relationship throughout this run as well. Which I guess they have a roller coaster of a relationship in all the runs, but you know what I mean. A great splash page here in front of this building. Again, the great Rick Parker le title lettering right there. We start to get some of these vertical panels um, from Toddy Mac, that would become his uh, signature. There's great uh, Rick Parker sound effects lettering right there. Here's like where we first, so this is such a signature Todd McFarlane trope of these like profile views of someone's face. Uh, this isn't quite the, we normally see like a little bit more of the face there, but that's like an early piece of it. There's some great horror imagery right there. That's like one of the revelations I had too, is that it was really Toddy Mac putting in the horror imagery of um, into Spider-Man, which I think was something that people don't give Steve Ditko credit for. I think St Steve Ditko had like a lot of that creepiness in his um, early run and Todd McFarlane would go on to work with a lot of the same villains as the Steve Ditko creations in this run, not counting like the Prowler and the Shriek and Hydro here, but we would get like the Green Goblin and Lizard. Um, I think Mysterio pops in one. Again, some great title lettering by Rick Parker. Here's another collage image. So the, the background here is a, a collage, like a photo collage with Spider-Man pasted on top of it. All right, I wanna to flip to the uh, adjective with Spider-Man. Oh, here's 328. So here's the last part. Was there a, uh... no, okay. I thought there was a fold out. Spider-Man 328 where we see the Hulk. I always loved Todd McFarlane's Hulk too. He always had like that, uh, the Neanderthal kind of brow to the Hulk, which I think is like necessary. For... I, w I want the Hulk to look like a monster. I don't want him to look like a handsome guy like he did in the Gary Frank run. I want him to look like a, a big monster. 
and Todd McFarlane always did a great job of that. All right, here's the edge to a uh, Spider-Man run. So we get the cover image to separate it in the book. And the opening page is Lizard, which I used to have an action figure of this Lizard um, when I was a kid. I think it was, I think it was sold as being part of the animated series, but it was totally the Todd McFarlane design for that character. <clears throat> and speaking of the horror horror imagery, having the black borders on here was it was a choice by Todd McFarlane, which I think added to like the darkness and the spookiness of of this run. That was another revelation too. It's like I was a huge fan of the Batman, or sorry, the Spider Man animated series in the '90s, and they took so much from that, so much from the specifically the Michelini and McFarlane run of Spider Man for that TV series, down to the way the characters spoke and everything. So if you're a fan of that, then I think you'd, you'd enjoy this run. Here's the uh, a signature way it, uh, panel that McFarlane would do frequently in his Spawn run. Again, the great profile image here. Here's all these vertical panels, which is another thing. And that's the one thing that separated Todd McFarlane from uh, his peers at the time. And then things that a lot of the image founding fathers would do is just like these totally different panel layouts that would be like frowned upon back in the silver bronze age of Marvel. And just being like cre really creative with things. Another great profile image right there. Spider-Man with the ripped up mask. Lizard in the shadows there looks great. Here's a great two-page spread with Ghost Rider and Hobgoblin and Spider-Man. Ghost Rider on his bike. This is such a page that just explodes of the 90s, right? Like this is 90s era comics. Great lettering by uh, Rick Parker. There's another Ghost Rider right there, right here. I love that. I I need to. I I wish I had a copy. I don't have a copy of the omnibus anymore, of the printed page to see what that looks like after it's colored, because it just looks so sketchy. The webbing would just get insane though, and I just loved it. That's one thing the trade paperback I had that my brother bought me that I talked about. On the back of it, like the the big blur caption would say like it said something like. They even talked about the way he drew webs or something like that. Wolverine. You don't get a lot of uh, Tony Mac doing Wolverine. Oh, there's Wolverine. Look at the cigarettes bent too. He's like chewing on it almost. You won't see that in any modern Marvel comics now that Disney owns them. I wonder if that's Scott owning, Scott doing beer owning that? I don't know. Great image of Spider-Man and Wolverine. That's the thing about the 90s too, is like you always had Spider-Man or Ghost Rider or Wolverine cameoing in all these issues. Some more great title lettering by Parker. So it's a really cool artist edition, especially if you're a fan of Toddy Mac profile image, um, to see his art progress through the years of Marvel. Literally from like the beginning of a Spider-Man run through the end of it. All that great webbing. And then here's some covers. Um, here's the cover of 299, uh, which is the first issue they showed. And they even have a table of contents for the cover issues, which they have, they don't have every cover there. And then, okay, so they don't have every cover, but they have quite a few. I think that's the cover of the uh, trade paperback. I think they used, reused that image for the trade paperback I had. There's a 300, the famous 300 issue. Which is funny that they went to 301 with the same pose of Spider-Man. But they got away with that. I don't know. <laughs> Again, that crazy cape. Here's a cool thing too, Ty McFarlane. So this was always the box for a newsstand um, distribution. Would have a barcode there. But if you bought it on the direct market um, with at a comic book shop or something, that would either be blank or if the artist was creative and, and kind of took advantage of that, they would draw in there. And Todd McFarlane would always draw a cool image in there, whether it be like Spider-Man or, or the paid or the issue number in there. So it's a cool little added touch. Like there's, he drew a Spider-Man, drew Hobgoblin. Cool little added touch that's almost like the corner box that um, the Silver Age guys used to draw. 
uh, that I just love that Todd McFarlane was, you know, that thoughtful in uh, using all the space that he had. Here's the cover image of this book, which you can see. And it looks like since this is lighter on his hands, I, I want to say that those are paste overs, that maybe he didn't like the way he drew the hands originally and then redrew them. Otherwise, I don't know why those are lighter than the rest of his body. But that's what I assume happened there. Tom McFarlane in this one, so he must have not drawn anything in there. So he, he gave this cover to Glenn, the infamous Lubinsky cover. I gave that to him. I don't know. Here's a cool image of Hulk. He drew here. Venom's in this one. And then here's the... Uh, that's not the... Is that the end papers? I don't think it is. No, it's not. I also do love the uh, reworking of the title lettering there, which I don't know if that's Rick Parker or Todd McFarlane doing that. But... Even the corner box, I always love when they play with the title lettering on the image. Here's the famous issue, number one of Spider-Man, which at the time of the, the release of this, this was the best-selling comic book of all time. It then got surpassed by X-Force number one and then X-Men number one. Yeah, the, the figure I had for Lizard, which I probably still have somewhere. I think my son played with it when he was a kid. Um, or when he was younger, sorry. He's, he's still a kid. But I think you can almost pose it in this exact pose. Just great lettering by Rick Parker. Just really want to emphasize his contribution to this run. And these were reprints. These Marvel, or no, this is a fan magazine. This is Marvel Age magazine. This was like their wizard magazine they had from Marvel. These were the reprints, the Marvel Tales. So these would collect classic issues of Spider-Man, um, like Dicko era or Bronze Age era. And Todd McFarlane did some of these covers. Spider-Man and Iceman. An angel. There's cool Spider-Man with the classic era X-Men. This is amazing. This is like one of the most famous pieces. Probably, I mean, it's either that cover or the Spider-Man etched to the number one cover. Might be the most famous covers in this entire book. Or most famous pieces of art in the entire book. If I can find it. Okay. Right there. Either that cover or this one. But this one's been homaged. Well, I mean, I guess they both have been homaged to death. But this one's been homaged a ton. And just a reflection of Hulk. And then I love this note here. Some kind of production trick for Hulk's reflection. So whether... <clears throat> I don't know if he's wanting like a chromium cover or whatever he was wanting for that. And then the back page with a little bit of bio on Toddy Mac. And then there's the end papers. So really a great book. Great collection. A must-have for any Todd McFarlane fan um, or any Spider-Man art fan. Uh, but thank you guys for watching. You can get this book for $2 off at OrganetPriceBooks.com if you use my promo code TaylorTalksComics, all one word. Or if you order this and three more books, or any four books you want, the larger order, you can save 5% off with my other promo code TTC, ship it together. Thank you guys for watching. Comment down below. I reply to all comments. Uh, give the video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll catch you guys on the next one. Keep reading comics.